Okay, you are there, right, Jim? Oh, I am. Hello, okay. everyone. All right. um, Jim, I will let you introduce yourself, but we are delighted to have Jim with us today. I'm sure you've all read his bio in our brochure. Um, we're happy to have Jim, who has certainly um, put Brunswick even more on the map of late. You know, we are a very large county, and it's sometimes hard to make sure that every part of our county gets the love it deserves and all the people in our county get the love they deserve. And sometimes it's a very long way from Brunswick to Thurmont or Brunswick to Emmitsburg or Brunswick even to Frederick. But Jim has certainly, particularly doing um, online programming, has brought Brunswick to the forefront once again. So take it away, Jim. Well, thank you for that. Uh, that was great. And my name is James Castle. I am currently the executive director. It's a volunteer position at the Brunswick Heritage Museum in Brunswick, Maryland. I for the last seven years have served as the president there. And I have been involved uh, in the at the museum there in Brunswick uh, since the age of 18, which uh, is well over 20 years. So um, I do want to apologize for one thing. Um, I have this very small screen in front of me, but I have a very larger screen that I will be looking at. So I, I apologize for not making eye contact during the presentation. Um, but uh, as as we get older, I got to look up here at this large screen. Um, I am always honored to talk about uh, the history of Brunswick. Um, and a lot of times, or most of the time, 99% of the time, I speak of, you know, Brunswick as this industrialized uh, mecca in Frederick County. Very rarely do I ever get to talk about uh, pre-1890 Brunswick, which was called Berlin. And Berlin is uh, what we're gonna call a Maryland ghost town, uh, Berlin along the Potomac. And if you could go to the next slide, please. So when we hear of a ghost town, this is what we think of. Uh, we think of a, a, a an abandoned town out west where, you know, the gold uh, left the ground, there was no more work and the whole town was abandoned. But I am here to tell you today of a story of a ghost town in Maryland. Um, it may not be unique to have a ghost town within an existing town, but I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, Brunswick's ghost town of Berlin. Next slide, please. So let's talk about some early names and owners uh, of the area that we now call Brunswick. And the natives uh, called this area Illpot uh, and Buffalo Wallows, uh, simply because the area was plentiful with eels and um, buffalo roamed here. And in fact, buffalo remains have been found in the area of the Brunswick campground. Um, the early Europeans crossed the Potomac River here, calling this area German Crossing and Potomac Crossing. The area was part of a land grant uh, to John Hawkins called Hawkins's Merry Peepo Day, um, an interesting, catchy title, as many of those land grants were. Hawkins dies in 1758, and the land is left to his sons, and the parcels of land <clears throat> pass through various owners. Next slide, please. Enter Leonard Smith, uh, 1780. Uh, this gentleman purchased 200 acres um, of an area that he's pretty familiar with because he plotted an area uh, close uh, by called Newtown. It's also called Trap Town. It was also called Trap and we know it today called Jefferson. In 1787, Smith plots 96 lots and called this for uh, this village Berlin. Um, why Berlin? Um, it was basically used as a marketing idea. He knew that uh, folks were crossing the Potomac to get to Virginia. In fact, Lovettsville, Virginia is called the German settlement. Um, and it was actually marketing. Uh, he wanted to attract German settlers uh, to stay here. So he called his new town, his new village, Berlin. Next slide, please. 
1794, uh, I'm sorry, it looks like the, uh, the presentation did something funky there, but um, he, he uh, you can go on to the next one, but he dies in, in uh, 1794 after selling over uh, 45 of those lots. Um, and the remaining lots are passed through to his heirs and then also are all eventually sold. Next slide, please. So Berlin prospers. Um, Berlin prospers mainly because of a small agricultural economy uh, with a flouring mill. And to piggyback on uh, a lot of the subject matter of today, um, you know, we talk about uh, folks named C.F. Winter. Uh, we talk about uh, people by the name of Captain Short who owned a large farm, but uh, Berlin prospered on the backs of uh, enslaved labor. Uh, those folks were, were large slave owners. Uh, they were 50 year old men with large, large, large farms who certainly didn't uh, farm them themselves. Uh, that's a part of the history that doesn't get spoke about a lot, but that is the truth. Uh, next slide. So the first known photograph is about to be shown uh, to you here of Berlin. And during the 1860s, uh, to actually own a, a, a nice camera, uh, certainly you would have been a person of wealth. Um, a lot of times a person roamed town to town with their uh, photography equipment, uh, charging for photographs. But uh, something very important happened in Berlin that brought uh, a very well-known photographer to, to this area. And if you click on the next slide. Uh, this is 1863. This is an Alexander Gardner print uh, photograph. Um, you are actually standing uh if i was standing today well this might not be helpful if you don't uh, know much about brunswick but this is uh currently where the old fire hall uh is located and uh the interesting uh, i this is a wonderful photograph this is a a little bit of a blurry blurred copy because it's uh zoomed in a little bit it, it cropped out some some other things um but um one thing that I would like to point out is you can see the rolling hills of, of what is now Brunswick. Um, obviously, the, the wagon in the bottom left uh, is, is large because it's close to you. And um, the first row of, of uh, Civil War Union uh, wagons, uh, you know, is the next hill. Then the row there with the Shelby tents is the ne next row. Um, interestingly enough, the railroad tracks have never moved. Um, those railroad tracks where those train cars are is, is where the railroad tracks are today. And another feature there, two very important features to current day Brunswick is you can see the body of water, which is the Sino Canal. And you can also see the main body of water, uh, which is the Potomac River. And what you're looking at is uh, the post Gettysburg, uh, when the Confederates uh, entered into Virginia, this is the Union uh, Army chasing them. Um, and that is because the Confederates burned our bridge uh, in 1850. I'm sorry, the bridge was built in 1858 and they burned it in 1861. The pontoon bridges uh, had to be built across the Potomac. And uh, that is what Gardner was taking a photograph of here. You'll see the remnants of old Berlin buildings there to the left. Um, probably none of those buildings. Uh, in fact, I'd actually say that none of those buildings are actually in existence uh, today, unfortunately. Uh, next slide. So here is a map of Berlin, 1858. This is pretty much how it would have looked uh, during the Civil War. Uh, and you see that it is it is pretty simple. It is uh, three streets going north and south with uh, two roads going east and west. Um, and the names of the street uh, were pretty simple. It was First Street, sec uh, Middle Street, they called it, but then also later Second Street and then Third Street. 
um, and I will show you a modern map here in a little bit uh, to compare where we're at. Um, but as you can tell, it was a small village, uh, probably about 30 to 40 houses there. Um, and we'll see how it progresses here in the next slide. We have uh, Berlin of 1873. Um, pretty much the same town, although it's, 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 it's built up. Um, there are some very prominent Brunswick names here. Uh, you know, you will see the names of C.F. Winter, who owned the mill, John L. Jordan, uh, who also uh, owned another mill. Um, so you can see how the, the, uh, it, the economy was based upon the agriculture. Um, and the um, one interesting feature also is, is that, you know, to enter Brunswick now, you come off of, uh, you can come off of two main highways into town. And you'll see there to the, under the railroad tracks there to the left, that is actually the main county road uh, that led you into Berlin uh, from Knoxville. Um, and as soon as you entered uh, the town, what, what welcomed you was, of course, the, the railroad depot. Next slide, please. This, I like to actually call one of our earliest photos because after the Civil War, this was when the, that as far as we know, the first photographer kind of came to town, said, you know what, I'm going to take uh, uh, some photographs. And you'll notice my favorite part of this, besides everybody loves the dogs, um, my favorite part of this photograph is the fact that it is a professional artist. It's, it's, you'll see the sign uh, that it's signed at the bottom. It's dated May 3rd of 1882. And the thing that intrigues me as a historian is, uh, and I see that you're, you're posting some, uh, some questions and, and I will get to those uh, at, at, the, uh, at the end of the presentation, but, but good questions, especially that one that just popped up. So, um, um, the thing that is very intriguing uh, for a historian is this is the only photograph uh, that we know of or that we have in the museum's possession that was taken this day, May 3rd of 1882, by this professional photographer. If anybody knows anything about professional photography, you don't show up somewhere and take one photograph. So this photographer probably took at least 10, if not 15 or 20 photographs uh, throughout the village, but unfortunately, this is the only one that we have of, of this particular uh, visit. And that is a restaurant and saloon. This is what Berlin buildings look like. Uh, very, very um, primitive construction. Um, although not, you know, um, not so different than other buildings that were built during this time period. But, uh, you know, some people on my walking tours, I will call them shacks by the railroad tracks. And this is kind of what it looked like. Um, also, an interesting historical note is that very rarely uh, will you see something marked in Berlin, or at least in Brunswick, uh, marked saloon um, after 1890 until the repeal of Prohibition, because contrary to some popular belief, um, the railroad actually uh, had, a no, had a very zero tolerance policy for alcohol and alcohol was actually banned in Brunswick uh, for the use of railroad workers. So I'm sorry, let me get back to my main uh, focus here. Uh, it is easy for me to, uh, to go off on some of these uh, historic tangents, um, but what did Berlin buildings look like? Uh, so there's an example. Let's look at some other examples with the next slide. Again, uh, very primitive buildings. Um, interestingly enough, in the top right-hand corner uh, is the first Horon's drugstore. Um, Dr. Horon was a very unique individual um, that he graduated from high school very early. Uh, he went to medical school and also graduated from pharmacology uh, college. Um, he had it figured out. He could actually tell you what was wrong with you and write the prescription uh, to, to make you better again. Um, he also started his business right on the cusp of the soda fountain craze. 
But this gentleman uh, started in this, again, it's just a shack by the railroad tracks. Uh, and he later built a wonderful uh, three-story brick uh, building in, in 1910 um, in the prosperous Brunswick, uh, the, the prosperity that the uh, railroad brought to this area. Next slide. So in 1890, Berlin becomes Brunswick. And how did this happen? So during the 1880s, uh, the folks in Berlin kind of noticed that uh, some railroad folks are poking around. Um, the old uh, lore goes that some uh, folks showed up offering about three times what an acre was really worth and bought up uh, huge amounts of, of land. Um, and lo and behold, these folks uh, were agents for the railroad, speculators. Um, the railroad then made the decision to move its main yard operation from Martinsburg, West Virginia to, uh, to Brunswick, Maryland. The town population of Berlin, 200, uh, would quickly go in just a matter of a few years to well over 2,000. Um, and that created the boomtown of 1890 Brunswick. Uh, if you've ever been to Ocean City on the Eastern shore, right outside of Ocean City is uh, the town of Berlin. And that Berlin uh, postmaster and our Berlin postmaster uh, started um, having nightmares and bad days at work because the mail was getting mixed up. Uh, they even tried putting, you know, Berlin Frederick County on mail. It still got messed up. Um, one postmaster even renamed the um, post office as P.O. Barry. Um, and that failed to work as well. So it was actually the railroad who named Brunswick. Um, there is a Brunswick, Germany. I, I'm not going to try the pronunciation. I'm going to butcher it. It's something like Russian wog. Um, it, uh, they wanted to keep the German heritage name. Um, and in fact, uh, when Berlin was started, there was very uh, little um, actual Ber uh, German immigrants here. But uh, the industrial boom brought a lot of German immigrants to the area. So, so they named it Brunswick. And four months after they named it Brunswick, the first elections were held and off we were running as a town. Next slide, please. So the transition from Berlin to Brunswick is very um, oversimplified. In fact, I'm guilty of this. Historians do this a lot. We're, we're just in a hurry to tell the story sometimes. And when I, a lot of times when I'm, I'm presenting this, it's like, okay, we were Berlin, 1890, we become Brunswick and we're, we're this huge town and that's it, you know, and that's, that's how it gets presented. And then we're all talking about the railroad, but the, the, the transition from Berlin to, to Brunswick really takes uh, 20 years, you know, on the day we became Brunswick, all of the most of the Berlin buildings were in existence. Really, Berlin just became Brunswick. Um, and it wasn't until um, some important things started to take place that you really see a change in the building, the architectural landscape. Next slide, please. So even here uh, in 1899, uh, nine years after the big move uh, and incorporation in 1890. This is a Sanborn map. And uh, about a decade, maybe 15 years ago, I was introduced to the Sanborn maps on a visit to the Maryland room. And if you've never looked at Sanborn maps for your town, I recommend that you do so because they are a wealth of interesting um, tidbits and knowledge. Um, they're insurance maps. So every structure, every outhouse, every outbuilding, every garage, stable, industrial building uh, are, is located on these maps. A lot of times with some interesting footnotes that would be pertinent to insurance. 
uh, square footage, what the construction was, um, and, and things such as that. But I'd like to note that right down here in the area uh, of what was Berlin or when Berlin turned to Brunswick, they actually noted on this map, almost like a neighborhood of Old Town Berlin. And that's, this is the only map that I've really seen that on. And uh, it's fitting because that's exactly what it is. It is that, um, it is that area of, of, uh, of the uh, Brunswick, the Old Berlin section. Next uh, slide, please. Here are some shots of old uh, Berlin uh, or the Berlin section of Brunswick. And interesting note is again, these railroad tracks have never moved. So the railroad tracks you see in Brunswick are still located in those that exact um, area. All of those buildings to the right, if you will, and I'm on the picture to the left, but actually, all of the all of the buildings on the right hand side, um, they're gone. That is the uh, commuter parking lot right now, uh, where the Mark Station is. Um, but interestingly enough, here we are in in uh, probably as late as 1910, maybe 1912. Certainly, the clothing there to the bottom right is is I would think is about circa 1910 or so. Um, um, is is here we are with these wonderful uh, old buildings uh, of Berlin. Interesting, uh, some more historical footnotes. The tall building to your left, uh, dead center, is the Brunswick Opera House, uh, which was the main social building of Brunswick when it was constructed. Um, it is the place where obviously, you know, they showed movies, um, theater, uh, social gatherings were held there. Uh, interestingly enough, at one point in time, there, the weight of the crowds uh, was not anticipated by the architect and the floors actually started to, to give, um, which kind of led to its, uh, its being condemned later on. Next slide, please. Oh, oh, wait, can we go back? Sorry about that, Carrie. Um, interesting uh, footnote as well, on the top right uh, photograph, you'll see a gentleman standing right in the middle of the tracks with a white shirt on. The very few photographs that we have of Berlin mostly always show this gentleman standing there. He was actually employed by the railroad. Uh, there was no electronic signals, electric signals. Um, and his job was to stand there to make sure people did not get hit by the train. Um, as most of these things are reactionary, um, it would tell you that numerous people got hit by a train right there in that intersection, which caused the railroad to put somebody there to, uh, to warn people of, of train traffic. Next slide, please. So the demolition of Berlin, um, why did it happen? Uh, three, three reasons really factor into this. Uh, number one is the railroad expansion, which we'll talk about, um, flooding and neglect and fires. And I actually was able to find, courtesy of the Brunswick History Commission, a photograph that shows all three of these in, in one photo. And if we could see that photo, please. Next slide. So this wonderful photograph just happened to get uh, uh, posted on their Facebook page. And it's basically like, look at this great photo that was just uh, this interesting photo that was just donated. And my comment immediately was, this is probably one of the most significant finds historically for Brunswick um, in, in a year, I mean, in, in many years actually. But this is the old Berlin section of Brunswick, which then shows the, uh, a fire that had happened at the old opera house. Um, and then you can also see the deteriorating conditions of the, of the structures around it. Um, this area became so decayed by the teens that it actually took on a nickname called Mousetrap, uh, basically because the mice ran and rats ran pretty freely in this area. Um, in fact, there were some squatters who actually uh, took over a vacant building and created their own little speakeasy saloon 
uh, and called their speakeasy saloon the mousetrap. Um, and so, you know, we see neglect and fire here. If you notice in the background of the photograph is the Potomac River. Um, and these buildings were obviously all built in the floodplain. Um, you know, uh, floods as significant as Agnes uh, and even as significant as the one that happened in the 1990s um, saw the floodwaters come way over those railroad tracks that you see in the foreground. And then you see the railroad boxcar, the B&O boxcar uh, there to the left. And if we're looking at the Opera House, you know, way to the left is the one of the great Brunswick railroad yards. And to the right, uh, which included the Brunswick Roundhouse uh, and the shops, which, which employed at one time 500 men a day, uh, three shifts a day. Um, to the right was another huge yard uh, leading to Knoxville. And what did you have in the middle of those two significant yards and work area was this little village which slowed down progress, which slowed down trains, which created uh, um, safety issues with people getting hit by trains. Um, you can see how close, I mean, nobody would ever build a building today that close to the railroad tracks. Um, and so the railroad decided to try to take over this area. Um, it was not an easy task. Uh, in the end, history tells us that the railroad wins. The railroad normally always wins. However, there were some people who gladly sold their land. There were people who held out for more money and eventually got it. And there were people who stood on their porches with guns uh, that basically um, the taking, if you will, had to go through the court system. But eventually the railroad ends up with, for the most part, all of this property um, and turns it into, and once done, once completed, turns it into uh, the biggest railroad yard in the country owned by a single railroad. So that was not in Los Angeles. That was not in New York City. That wasn't in Chicago. Uh, that actually was in your Brunswick, Maryland, right here in Frederick County. If we could go to the next slide. So just to put it in perspective, uh, what you saw is right there uh, in those, uh, that area there by the railroad tracks. So all of this area south, all of these properties south, all of this land south, um, besides the mill um, where you see John L. Jordan's name, lot 62, everything else was eventually purchased by the railroad or took by the railroad. Um, and became part of the railroad yard. Um, next slide, please. So to put the current day Brunswick in uh, to perspective, you see Third Street to your right, Second Street in the middle, and Bridge Street uh, to your left. High Street today is the main street through downtown, which is West Potomac. Um, Third Street now equals Maple Avenue. Second Street equals Maryland Avenue. And First Street, which is also called Bridge Street, is Virginia Avenue. Um, if you're familiar with Brunswick, that at least puts that in, into some perspective. Next slide, please. So let's talk about a few ghosts of Berlin. Um, interestingly enough, only 12. Uh, structures uh, from Berlin still exist in the city of Brunswick today. There are probably, to be honest, that that's what history tells us. That's what the documentation tells us. I probably, I think there's a few more. I think that some uh, of the un, uh, no, I, I hate to call them unnoticed houses, but some of the houses there on Virginia Avenue or Maryland Avenue, if we uh, did enough research, would actually show are probably right on that cusp of. 1889, 1890, when they were built. But, uh, you know, there's very few and uh, really only about 12 remain. Next slide, please. So let's look at a few of these ghosts. This uh, house actually just got local press coverage. That photo uh, was uniquely um, uh, took 
uh, from the News Post website. I just at least should give them credit for that photograph. It was a right click, uh, copy and save. But uh, this is the Snoots house, uh, called the Snoots house because that was the family that owned it from the 40s to the 1990s. Um, and it was most likely uh, built uh, right around the 1830s. Um, and this was slated to be uh, demolished uh, with a housing development that is actually proposed in this area. And uh, it was actually saved uh, by Preservation Maryland. Uh, they were able to get grant money through the Depart Maryland Department of Housing uh, to actually uh, rehab uh, this particular structure. Next slide, please. So the house beside of it is what's called the McDonald's uh, Railroad Boarding House. Uh, this house was actually, of course, wasn't used uh, as, as a boarding house when it was first built, but it is a huge structure. Um, and basically, they always called it two houses in one house. Um, and uh, Miss McDonald's was a railroad widow. Um, her husband perished. And uh, what a lot of times what happened is uh, railroad widows were left with these huge Victorian homes um, and what they felt they needed to do or they wanted to do or was forced to do is they actually let out rooms and uh, created these boarding houses because there certainly was a shortage for uh, housing for railroad workers. And so this was the McDonald Railroad Boarding House. Uh, the photograph in your right is a picture taken about 1893. The Brunswick Bridge is faintly in the background. That's how we're able to date it. Notice that the Brunswick uh, Opera House is still setting there in, in Old Berlin. Um, and you can see the house there to your right, uh, the one with that circle window and the, and the four windows that you can see. Uh, this house, though, unfortunately, is being demolished, uh, most likely, um, as part of the of the housing project. So our 12 ghosts are will be down to 11. Uh, next slide, please. So the Meadows building. Um, the Meadows building uh, is a pretty significant building architectural wise there with uh, and I'm not using proper architectural um, terminology here, but that little, I, I can't really explain it. It almost like, so it looks like a little castle, um, you know, uh, tower there on the building. Um, it's very unique uh, for Brunswick. Uh, the lower right picture is uh, about early 1900s, uh, mainly because that Victorian home uh, to the left was demolished in 1910. Um, to make room for Huron's drugstore, which is now there. Um, there's a modern photo there in the snow. Um, the top right shows all three of those uh, historic uh, buildings uh, in a 1910 postcard. And the top left, uh, one of the more famous businesses located in that storefront was a, a business called Smith and Carlisle, um, which was a general merchandise store. Um, this building is going to be part of the Railroad Square housing development. Next slide. This is the William L. Gross house. Uh, the front part of the house was built in uh, the 1840s. Uh, the house does show up in those pictures of, that Gardner took during the Civil War. Um, William L. Gross was the most prominent businessman of Brunswick. Uh, in fact, he actually, in uh, 1877, arrived uh, in Berlin. And uh, William L. Gross had it pretty figured out because his house was located right next to his store. And his store was located right next to the railroad tracks. So Mr. Gross could actually sell you a farm implement, have it delivered to the store, you pick it up. He never touched it, yet he made the profit on, on selling the goods uh, right off the railroad. Um, we have his ledger books in the museum and, uh, you know, just in 1890 alone, just in 
credit business, uh, he was doing somewhere between like 60 and $80,000 a year, just in the, just in credit that didn't include cash. So the, the man was very wealthy um, and he had a wonderful residence here. It is currently a residence. Um, um, unfortunately, it wasn't until about five or, uh, you know what, I've lost a couple of years due to COVID, but let me just at least go back a decade to be safe. Um, not the current owner did this, but uh, that front porch had wonderful Victor pre-Victorian gingerbread on the front. And I was driving down the road and a contractor was ripping that gingerbread off. And I slammed on my brakes and I got out of my car and he turned around and he was like, hey, look, dude, you're the 10th per person who stopped. I'm just getting paid to do, do my job. And uh, even he was uh, pained by ripping off that, that pre-Victorian gingerbread off that, that house. Um, next slide, please. So Brunswick's oldest home uh, is called the Beale McMurray House. Um, fire, it had unfortunately suffered a fire in 2020. Um, up top is, a photo, is another Alexander uh, Gardner photograph. Um, this is taken from the Virginia side. And um, by Liz. Um, and up in the top right hand corner of that photograph, I actually took an insert down there in the bottom left hand corner. Um, you'll see that house, you know, up setting up above the three, which kind of has an offsetting front door with the two windows up the top. And that is this house. That is the Beale McMurray house. Um, it is currently being restored. Um, and hopefully they are able to put this, uh, this house back, back in use. That, um, that porch that you see in the bottom right hand photograph, it's not probably, well, we know it's not original to the house, right? You can see the 1860 photograph. A lot of these porches were added in the 1880s, 1890s, because that's what kind of came in vogue um, at the time. So that porch is uh, 1880s, 1890s, that would work. Next slide, please. In the top right, not the building that says Fast Steadies, but the larger building in the back uh, is now four uh, apartments. But when it was built, as you can see in the photograph below, it was one large house. And that was the house of Brunswick's first mayor. And uh, his name was John L. Jordan. Um, and that house was built in the 1850s uh, by his father, who was also named John L. Jordan. Uh, interestingly enough, this John L. Jordan was elected mayor. Um, got a lot of the first ordinances uh, passed uh, forming the town and then gaining in popularity, um, he ran for clerk of the circuit court. And he, if you ever uh, do deed research from around 1895 to about 1900, um, his very wonderful, neat handwriting is what you find in the jail, JLJ um, deed books at the courthouse or online if you're doing that research. Next slide. I'm sitting there clicking my screen like I can do it. So that is six of the uh, 12 ghosts of, of Old Berlin, the ghost town. Um, what we hope you do is uh, visit us. We hope you uh, take uh, the time to come down to Brunswick, visit us at the Brunswick Heritage Museum. We open up March 19th. Uh, we close every year from July to March to do maintenance and it gives time for curatorial uh, volunteers to, um, to do some work on um, our artifacts. But we're located at 40 West Potomac Streets. Uh, that is our website. Um, if you would ever love to chit chat with me, I, my email address is jamesrcastle at comcast.net. And I'm going to open up the chat and let's see what I can do to help. Oh, 
All right. Very exciting photo because that, yes, that was a photo. So did Blacks own any property in Berlin? So some, some interesting uh, history here is that prior to the Civil War, um, the population was 60% white, 40% Black. Now, again, you're talking about a population of 200. Another interesting fact was post-Civil War, the 1870 census, Brunswick, or Berlin, I'm sorry, was still 60% uh, black, uh, white, 40% black. Um, it wasn't, unfortunately, it was after 1890, uh, Jim Crow lived everywhere. He also lived in uh, Br Brunswick and it wasn't until, uh, you know, people all over the country could, could commit a crime and, and basically get away with it is when uh, the population turned 99% white and 1% black. Did blacks own property in Berlin? Uh, there were a few, uh, yes, there wasn't many. Um, and there were a lot after uh, 1890 Brunswick. Um, and then certainly as, as time went on, ex especially post-war, um, Brunswick was segregated. Uh, there, the Brunswick train station had a white section, had a black section. Schools were segregated up until the 60s. Um, but that direct question, did black, any blacks own property in Berlin? Yes, there were uh, very few. Um, most of them prior to the Civil War, of course, were enslaved. Um, the, they, uh, they lived, uh, they became, most became domestic servants with the same folks who were their slavers um, post-Civil uh, post War. Um, so they lived at the same location, but a few did buy property. Um, so that, that answers that question. When did Sandmore, Sandborn maps start being created? That might be a, a question for Mary. 1867. Uh, oh, wow, look at that, look at that. Now the first one for Brunswick, I think was, uh, I found in 1890. So I'm, I'm assuming that there had to be some level of importance or interest before they did a Sandborn map, I, I'm assuming. Um, 1890 certainly would have been because the railroad was showing interest there. Um, I, I don't know the complete history of the Sanborn maps. I do believe the gentleman was involved in chasing Sanborn, or at least that, that same name. Um, but that's all I know, unless Mary can chime in with any other information. Um, mostly, and I will admit, I didn't know that date off the top of my head. I texted my sub and she looked it up for me. We do have a lovely book in the Maryland that talks about the history of Sanborns and gives the, um, at least the Library of Congress's catalog of Sanborns up to a certain point, but it had a lot to do. I've, I've never been sure like who brought them into town, but there had to be enough there to really, to survey and to really be industrial in the smallest sense of the term. Yep, and that is probably why they, they came to town in 1890s. Um, sorry, I'm coming back up here. Um, all right, uh, cool. So that, I, I was right about Breschenwag, or I'm, I'm guess I'm pronouncing that correctly, but but that's a nice little uh, piece. The Opera House is close to the train track. How did that work? Well, you know, if uh, you were in one of those saloons and you had a couple drinks and you went walking on that track, you probably got hit. And that is probably why that gentleman was employed to, to stand there at that intersection to get people off the tracks. Um, it was set up like an old Wild West town, if you think about it. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what it, was, it looked like. Interestingly enough, the same time the West was wild, is when Berlin existed. So it, it, interesting concept, um, kind of the same things going on, maybe without less uh, rifles, without less guns. Um, was there competition between the CNO Canal and the BNO Railroad for hiring? Um, the CNO is known for to have employed African Americans. How about the BNO Railroad? So that's all really that's all true, and that that's interesting. So there was great competition to begin with between the CNO Canal and the BNO Railroad. They were in the 1830s when they both arrived at Berlin, 
they were in a race. And uh, we now know, of course, that the railroad uh, won. Um, but the canal uh, was the main employer. Um, when, when the BNR Railroad got to Berlin, they didn't care about Berlin. They were trying to get to Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, um, which was a, a large, large city uh, on that line. They left at Berlin just uh, a few maintenance workers to take care of the tracks. So the heart of Berlin and the heart of, well, I can't say early Brunswick, but the heart of Berlin was really the CNO Canal. CF Winter's uh, choice uh, to move his flower was uh, by canal boat. Um, and the hiring was a, a little bit different because like I said, is they only hired a few maintenance people. So yes, they did have um, uh, more people were employed as, to work on canal boats and canal boat captains. Um, uh, the 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 African Americans. So the the um, Ceno Canal was was definitely uh, known for. I can't say employing, but yes, they had. Um, it was possible for blacks to own canal boats to be their own uh, boat captains. And you saw that a lot. We actually have some photographs in the museum collection of such a whole crew on a canal boat, which was most, most likely uh, the same family, um, you know, on the canal boat operating there in, uh, in Berlin. Um, the railroad hired blacks as laborers. Um, they built uh, they, they did not build, I, I, I take that back. So the building of the railroad was actually done by Irish and Italian immigrants. Um, to maintain the tracks, uh, the industrialized b &O Railroad hired Blacks for that labor. Um, they were not allowed to be uh, conductors. They were not allowed to be engine men. Um, the Interesting thing, though, is not trying to whitewash this or make it sound, uh, you know, so so much. I mean, better than than what it was. But there is one positive aspect that came out of the railroad work, is that um, railroad work was a lot about class and not always about race. What I mean by that is, if you were making a union pay and you were a laborer, there was not a black laborer wage and a white laborer wage. And um, yes, it was long, hard, grueling work, work that I couldn't do, right? even in a working crime. Uh, it was laborious, it was hot. Uh, somebody stood over you making you work the full 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, um, drinking out of uh, buckets that, that only you could drink out of and couldn't drink out of a, out of a white bucket. Um, but on the flip side, the pay was the same as, as the white labor and it, it was good money. Um, what was unique about Brunswick and it created a lot of animosity, it kind of created us, uh, animosity in other towns was that young men uh, were dropping out of high school and automatically getting a job that put them in the upper middle class. Uh, these folks were wearing ties and carrying brakeman's lanterns. Um, they did not have to go to college to, uh, to, to earn that, that it was dangerous work and it was hard work. Um, and it was not a work for dummies. Um, you were dealing with uh, machines that could easily kill people um, or, and yourself. So, uh, so, uh, that is some interesting facts. I think I, I think I attacked that. I, I I went all over the place, but I think I did answer that 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 question. I hope I did. Um, Liz jumped off. What became of the BNO Emergency Hospital? So yes, the Brunswick YMCA was located uh, on trackside, um, and attached to the. Uh, be it a YMCA, there was such a demand for um, doctors to deal with uh, railroaders that they built uh, a hospital. 
And not only did that hospital take care of railroad workers, but also took care of railroad workers' family and the community when it needed it, especially during the, uh, the 1914 pandemic. So what became of it is uh, as the railroad died, so did the need for the b &O Emergency Hospital and it got demolished from the Y. And then later in the, about 1980, unfortunately the Y suffered from a fire. And unfortunately that is a common theme with my beloved Brunswick is neglect and fire and no rebuild, um, which is a sad, sad part of, of our his, history. Um, is it true that one of the largest hobo jungles was once located north of Brunswick? Saw that recently online. I don't know if it was one of the largest in the country, but there was anywhere you have um, main railroad um, operations, you had those large uh, hobo colonies, or I wouldn't call anything a jungle, but, um, and it, it was uh, for two purposes. One, they could jump on a train and go anywhere in the United States, depending on where the train was was going. You could go out west, uh, or you could go up east. Um, the and or you know go down south once you got to Washington D.C., which is south, ironically. But um, the other thing was is that there was a huge friendly population here, which took to these hobos uh, and they fed them. Um, we had, uh, we had, <laughs> we could actually do a whole presentation on the hobo signs, the hobo language, the tags that were left saying, you know, police were here, don't go here. Uh, this person's nice, this person has good food. Um, and especially during the American uh, depression, and through World War II, you, we, we have a lot of oral history of folks just talking about how at the end of their meal, they would actually just walk on down to the edge of the railroad tracks and give their leftovers to, to these groups of, uh, of men and women and families uh, who needed food to eat. Um, the Brunswick Heritage Museum is one of Frederick County's hidden gems. Let me read that again. Hold on. I like that. The Brunswick Heritage Museum is one of Frederick County's hidden gems. Great curation and exhibits of everyday life in Berlin and Brunswick. Well, thank you very much. Um, good information. Thank you. Would love to see a hobo presentation in the future. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, we have so much segmentation of our history that it's really hard for us to give the holistic approach to everything. Um, we have tried to incorporate the humanities into our exhibits. We wanted more um, the black contributions to the railroad, um, the women taking over the railroad jobs during both World War I and World War II, um, uh, immigration. Um, you know, it's just such a, a lot of, of information. The Civil War, a whole uh, twice uh, Berlin was uh, headquarters of the Army of the Potomac once after uh, Antietam and once after Gettysburg. So, so just so much history and uh, so few volunteer, few volunteers, but thankful for every volunteer that we have. Um, very uh, excited about youth being involved in the museum. Um, and just, you know, I can't, we can't save everything. I, I mean, I try, we try our best, but we just have to keep on keeping on with what we can do. And, and every day is a desk full of uh, paperwork and artifacts and stuff to do. And, and we just try to keep pushing through. It. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for those uh, positive comments. And that's all I have, unless anybody else has anything else. Yeah, I was just gonna say, any other questions? Thank you so much, Jim. Fabulous photographs, fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Um, if nobody has any other questions, Elizabeth Comer, if you wouldn't mind starting 15 minutes early, would that work for you? If you're out there still, I know you're out there somewhere. All right, so we so it appears that, that she is out there. And so if everyone take a 15 minute break, come back at 3.30 and we will hear Elizabeth Comer or to tie in with a previous presentation, presentation, the daughter of the author of Faith in the Furnace.
That's 3.30. Come back at 3.30, everyone.